Welcome to the How We Can Heal podcast. My name is Lisa Danilchuk, and I'm a psychotherapist specializing in complex trauma treatment. I'm a graduate of UCLA and Harvard University, and I'm thrilled to share these reflections on how we can heal with you today. Today, our guest is Wendy Lemke. Wendy is a licensed clinical psychologist with over 30 years of experience. She specializes in and presents internationally on clinical hypnosis, ego state therapy, and trauma-informed treatment, all of which we'll talk about today. Wendy is a fellow, certified approved consultant, and former vice president of the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis, or ASH. She's served on the board for a number of hypnosis organizations and teaches basic, intermediate, and advanced workshops all around the world. She's also a fellow hypnosis instructor and active member of the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation, or ISSTD. Wendy has published peer-reviewed articles and has received more awards than I can recount here. Go ahead and check out howweCanHeal.com backslash podcast for all the show notes and the full scoop on her accolades. She wrote and produced the documentary, You're Not Crazy and You're Not Alone, Inside the Inner World of Dissociative Identity Disorder and offers self-hypnosis recordings you can practice on your own for sleep and deep relaxation. Wendy and I connected many years ago through the ISSTD, and she's become a fast friend of the family. She taught my own basic and intermediate hypnosis training, so I've had the opportunity to also be her student. I'm so excited for you to learn from her today, so let's dive in. Welcome, Wendy Lemke, to the How We Can Heal podcast. I'm very, very happy to be chatting with you today, and I just feel like we should be after a conference, sitting together at dinner and chatting about all the things. We're going to focus on dissociation and clinical hypnosis today, but I really want to talk to you about everything. <laughs> so we might have to, you know, schedule another time to chat. We'll have to schedule a happy hour time. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. <laughs> so you have, you are actually one of my trainers for clinical hypnosis um, through ASH and ISSTD. I mean, 10 years ago, I don't know, that was like 20... 12, 13, I can't remember. And I learned so much through that process. And of course, me in the back of the room, like stretching and doing yoga was also like, oh, this is so much like yoga and putting it all together. But I'm curious about your journey because I haven't heard this. How did you find clinical hypnosis? You know, I, I feel really blessed and fortunate to have discovered um, clinical hypnosis early in my career because I was a graduate student and I had a professor who offered a course on clinical hypnosis. It was an interesting course and I could see that I'm highly hypnotic as, as you know, but our listeners might not know. There's a couple components to clinical hypnosis and one is susceptibility and uh, meaning how easily you go into trance yeah. um, and suggestibility, you know, and I'm probably fairly high on both regards. So um, I could see that we, we had experiential exercises and I could see the clinical potential in graduate school. And then I'm also blessed to be, well, to live in, in, in Minnesota, except in the winter time, um, <laughs> because we have a wonderful Minnesota Society of Clinical Hypnosis. And a couple of my mentors are very well known in the field and actually created the curriculum that Ash used way back when. Um, Ash is the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis. And so... I started going to Minnesota trainings right out of graduate school, and I was hooked. And, you know, um, as you know, when we do those trainings, we um, are a subject. And I remember, like, yeah, it was yesterday, even though it was like, I quit counting it 30 years ago. But I was, I was a, a subject for a demonstration, and we could think of a mild problem. And um, I thought of a mild problem and I didn't have to share it with the group. And I went up and I'm highly hypnotic. It doesn't always work quite this efficiently, but I went into trance and they did this application and I didn't have that symptom that the thing I was thinking about, I didn't have it for eight years wow. after that one time. And, you know, 
I, I, there were a lot of things that went into went into that. So um, I just kept going back and getting more and more training every year. And then at about five, six years into my training through MISH, I wanted to meet the relatives <laughs> and the relatives yeah. are the American society. So I attended a, a session there and I was I was you know, hooked with them. And that became my um, second professional family, you know, until I came to ISSTD, where that became my third professional family. So it just, you know, it, it, it's been something that I keep learning about. And I'm so passionate about it. So I've taught for those organizations for years, you know, that's kind of how it started. And I'm curious, too. So there's that momentum and that getting pulled into one group and another group. And and then I'm curious, when did you learn about dissociation? When did that become a part of the work you were doing? Yeah. So nothing like trial by fire, you know, it, it, we didn't learn much back in the day, yeah. <laughs> back in the day, you know, in graduate school, I learned very, very little about dissociation. And what I did learn was not accurate. You know, I learned that dissociative back then it was multiple personality disorder. Right. Now we know it as dissociative identity disorder. And there's a number of other dissociative disorders that we treat. I learned very little in graduate school. I did um, a lot of volunteer work with the Central Minnesota Sexual Assault Center. And um, even in graduate school, I did a research project with them. And so when I started my uh, career, I was getting referrals from the Central Minnesota Sexual Assault Center. And I think I was I was facilitating a group of women um, and we were on the week. All of these women had been sexually abused or sexually assaulted, and it was a very cohesive group of women. And we were on about the sixth week of honoring what what we did to survive. Mm. And that was the theme of that group. And I had one woman um, who started to share that she had developed different parts. Um, Mm. She had names for the parts. And I, I think I had an intern at the time too. I was thinking, oh my gosh, this sounds like that rare thing that we were supposed to never see, you know, multiple personality disorder. And it, it turned out it, it wasn't that it was it was what now what we would call otherwise specified dissociative disorder back then it was dissociative disorder NOS but because of her she wanted to work individually with me and I said I was a rookie I didn't know what I was doing I thought she needed to see somebody else and she said no I'm really comfortable with you and I said, well, I'm willing to get consultation and learn and I was already trained in hypnosis. And she taught me so much. I'm so grateful to her because we we would work with parts of self. She knew very well her parts and she'd be like, you need to work with this part. And we do some hypnosis to access this part. And, you know, she really did her own therapy, but she she taught me about what was working. And then I started realizing that this parts work, I was so fascinated and intrigued with how we could help physical pain and how working with her parts and hypnotically and, and, and with the dissociative disorder, how um, effective it was in resolving internal conflicts. And I was enamored and started utilizing this kind of work with other people that talked parts, you know, part of me wants to do this, a part of me wants to do that. And was utilizing with other folks, also discovered I had more dissociative disorders on my caseload once I knew what I was looking for and had some consultation. And then I went to the Minnesota Society of Clinical Hypnosis Annual Conference and the Watkins, John and Helen Watkins Mm. uh, were there. And they presented ego state theory and therapy. And I, I was like, this is what I'm experiencing in my practice. This is, and they had a whole theoretical model and a a clinical approach that I'm very passionate about today and, and teach a lot on ego state therapy. And, and we're getting a renewed excitement about ego state therapy because parts work 
it's becoming more known and yes. the effective work with parts um, is becoming more known. And I, I, we started teaching ego state therapy outside of the clinical hypnosis field. Mm -hmm. So it, it's most people when they take the foundations of ego state therapy course, realize they want hypnosis training too, because they, they do weave together nicely. But so that's kind of how I got started with it all. You know, it just kind of found me. Yeah. Yeah. And you just kept going with it and you kept rolling with it and you found these professional families, which is, yeah, how, how it works. And, you know, I'm really grateful yeah. to have learned from you because I think sometimes it's hard to find trainings in specific modalities or approaches that are also really well trauma-informed and dissociation-informed. And so it was just great to be able to lean into that ASH training with you knowing, okay, this I don't have to go figure it out later. I can ask those hard questions here and now. Yeah. And yeah, it's so helpful. Well, and I think that's I think that's the value, Lisa, of of taking clinical hypnosis training from someone that is trauma informed. Because I, I like to present the training we offer through ISSTD as trauma informed clinical hypnosis. Yeah. I think all clinical hypnosis should be taught that way. Yeah. But I think you when you come from a lens of working from dissociative disorders, you exercise the utmost caution. Yeah. And and we don't know who those folks are. Um yeah. you know, and what are the prevalence rates? One out of a hundred. Yeah. So we're gonna see a lot of dissociative disorders even when you're not looking for it. Yeah. And I think we had Marianne Kate, you know, Dr. Marianne Kate, we had her on the show. And I think the studies that she did um, across the world were even higher than one in a hundred. I can't remember when we have to go back yeah. to the show. Well, yeah, and, and that in a there. clinical population, for sure. Yeah. And in, you know, a therapist population, for sure, because therapists have the most history of of trauma. Right. And I, I think John Breer, I, I remember him saying that he had done some research on all the professions and therapists have oh, the most history of, of trauma, oh. which makes which which makes sense though in terms of, of yes. post-traumatic growth. People yes. like to give meaning to their trauma and help others when they've been helped. So back at UCLA when I was doing research, we used to say research is me search too. So there's that. <laughs> You're like, I have I a question. That. I'm really curious about it. Let me go to school and learn. Oh, thankfully yeah. that's really helpful. <laughs> yeah, that's that's interesting. So yeah, I do think the prevalence rates are much higher than one percent but people think uh i think what is that i think that's the same prevalence one percent i think is the same as schizophrenia you okay. know which right and then we talked to dr heather hall about um discerning you know schizophrenia versus did or dissociation which is another whole conversation right right so if someone's just learning about dissociation and curious, like how would that and hypnosis work together? I mean, some folks might've heard that folks who are dissociative have a higher incidence of hypnotizability. And so how have you seen hypnosis be helpful in working with dissociation? Oh, there's so much I could say here. Um, let me try to think of how I can simplify it for our listeners. First, I probably need to kind of talk about what, what is hypnosis? Right. Yeah. So hypnosis can be a state because we all go in and out of states of trance. Yeah. So I like to think of clinical hypnosis. And when we say clinical, it means hypnosis utilized in a clinical way. Right. We're using it clinically to help treat psychological disorders or if physicians are using it for medical um, reasons or dentists you know, use it. So the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis teaches only healthcare professionals. And that's the difference because there are a lot of hypnosis organizations and we want to really, there's so much to be concerned with. I think sometimes hypnosis gets a bad rap yeah. and it's not because of the hypnosis we, or the trance. It's because of the suggestions Yes, that are given in hypnosis. And I, I always tell people, well, you know, what were the suggestions? Were they useful to you? 
Were they in your best interest? Yeah. At the time you were given those suggestions? Did you have trust in the person that was giving those suggestions? You know, think about entertainment hypnosis. They don't know their clients. I would hope you don't just give all your trust away to someone who's doing an entertaining act. That's why we want to we want to specify what clinical hypnosis is. And I like to call clinical hypnosis is just the capacity to utilize trance in a helpful healing way. Yeah. Right? With intention. Yes. With intention because we all go in and out of trance states. If you drive down the highway in Minnesota, it's 94, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're driving down 94 and you go through a town and somebody calls you and they're like, where are you? I don't know, somewhere in 94. Well, did you go by Monticello? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, some part of you is, is driving. Another part of you is very absorbed in your thoughts. Yes. And, you know, we call that highway hypnosis. Yeah. You know, so... Clinically, we we utilize trance in an intentional way yeah. because in trance, you are more suggestible. And so, and you can also have an experience, you know, that can be useful clinically that you can carry with you. Mm -hmm. So we tell people that and, you know, I say people are utilizing trance and I, I do, I have on my, on my agenda for either sometime later this year in 2024 to do a, a course for the lay, for the public on just educating them about suggestion yeah. and the suggestion you give yourself, you know, are you in trance when you are, be kind to what you say to yourself because you're listening, yeah. you know, parts of you are listening. So with dissociation and trance, we want, and trauma, you know, we want to provide positive trance experiences. A trance can be neutral, like highway hypnosis. It can be positive, like a mental vacation mm -hmm. um, or meditation, right? It can be a positive experience where you get in touch with positive things, or it can be really unpleasant, yeah. you know? flashback right where someone is in an altered state of consciousness and they're so absorbed in their trauma that it feels like it's happening again yeah that's a, a an unpleasant trance state mm -hmm. so much of what we when we utilize clinical hypnosis in the field of trauma a lot of times it's undoing or reorientating and ending unpleasant trance states or teaching our clients on how to get out of unpleasant trance states. Yes. You know, there's so many things we can do with hypnosis and trauma, but we, we want to help facilitate alternative states of trance so that somebody can feel a comfortable state, a mm. resource state. Mm -hmm. I always say if there's triggers to trauma, there are keys to comfort. I love that. And we can help facilitate keys to comfort hypnotically. Yes. Reinforce that, strengthen it. That's what we do first, right? Before we ever want to get into trauma, we want to make sure a client has the ability to find keys for comfort. Yes. I love that so you know? much. It's reminding yeah. me too of when I did the hypnosis training and I know, I think I did the two of them. So I'm trying to remember which one this was. It doesn't matter. I, I have still a visceral memory of one of the, you know, comfort ones. And I remember, I remember we were exercising, you know, okay, we learned this skill and then we're going to facilitate for our partner. We just met in the training. And I remember being so blown away by how little they actually said and where my, you know, psyche yeah. took it. And I still have this visceral memory. I mean, I was meditating in a cliff in Kauai on the Nepali coast trail. Like I can still feel it. I can still yeah. access that. And I've remembered it ever since, you know, a, a decade plus. It, it's it, awesome. It's so amazing. And it was just this little, okay, let's try this. You know, this is like, like you said about the client who really was like, no, I want to work with you. I mean, you had that connection and rapport already, but 
this is someone who's just learning, who doesn't, who's also fumbling around like I was, right. that facilitated this experience that was very um, rich for me with with very little suggestion. You know, there was enough trust there of like, here's another student. We're sitting yeah. next to each other. We've asked questions. We know each other to some degree. But it was really just, you know, I think it was kind of a, a peaceful place or, you know, accessing some internal yeah. feeling, but just these general suggestions. And I'm always astounded by that when I offer this to people, whether it's in the form of a meditation visualization at the end of a yoga class, or it's in a clinical yeah. setting, like the things that come when we're saying something really general, like yeah. notice the air, notice the ground. And, you know, they've got flowers sprouting everywhere and sea salt in the air and you know, like, okay, yeah. right. roll well. And and I utilize that experience. You're you're providing such rich detail, right? And it was very, it was a very pleasant experience for you. Yeah. And then if we think about our clients with trauma, mm. they unfortunately have as much absorption and yes. detail that their unconscious brings up for an unpleasant trance, right. you know, um, or when something gets triggered, it opens the unconscious to all those sensory experiences without much suggestion. Yeah. So if we can utilize suggestion, because that's, that's the two part components of hypnosis is the trance, right? And our clients no, they know a flashback trance. They know an unpleasant trance state when they're stuck. So if we can teach them how to use trance intentionally and to create or access pleasant experiences. Yeah. And, you know, part of trance is facilitated absorption. Yes. Right. You, we guide you or your unconscious mind we guide you to allow your own unconscious mind to take you to somewhere rich and help facilitate that with guiding suggestions. We have to be careful with the suggestions we utilize with trauma when in trance, because we can prime those suggestions for safety yeah. so that the unconscious mind reveals and we guide the unconscious mind to a path that is safe for the client. I love this keys for comfort, guiding a path of safety, like all of these things fit in so well with, you know, trauma informed best practice. And I'm thinking about, you know, me sitting in this training a decade ago and going, oh, you know, focused attention and absorption and how that fits. So like a mirror image with yoga philosophy, right? Yeah. Our philosophy is dharana, dhyana, samadhi, which is focused attention, absorption, or meditation. And then um, integration is really, or or enlightenment, some people will call it, but it's, you know, focused attention, absorption, and integration. And yeah. how that just goes so hand in hand with, you know, even what you're describing here of, you know, becoming aware of some of the more PTSD triggers that might be alive and meeting them with that comfort and bringing that comfort up to, you know, experience and fruition. Yeah. And just as you were saying, you know, thinking about you're, you're still surprised at what, what your unconscious mind provided you. Yeah. When you had that experience, when it was a general, probably group demonstration, right? Yeah. I, I think when we educate clients, we have to talk about the power of our unconscious mind. Yeah. I can't imagine doing therapy without hypnosis and an understanding of the unconscious mind because most of our behavior, our thoughts, our feelings, everything is associated. Our unconscious mind fuels so much and we don't know all, we're not always in touch with what our unconscious mind knows, right? Right, And so a lot of times people don't know where a feeling or where something is coming from. And we have to teach our clients how to safely listen to their unconscious mind because their unconscious mind has wisdom. Yes. It sometimes might be wisdom we don't want to hear, yeah. but it might be wisdom that guides our pace of therapy. It might be wisdom that has not only ideas about where a problem came from, but also ideas about solutions. 
Yes. You know, part of that theory comes from ego state therapy and, and the principles, you know, I, I look at ego state therapy as something that kind of guides my overall treatment. You know, um, I look at it as much more of a guiding principles for not just ego state therapy, but for all therapy, whether you're using EMDR or brain spotting or whatever somatic experiencing, there are principles that I learned through the Watkins that I've adapted along the way that help facilitate, like, you know, is it safe and manageable yeah. to utilize this protocol and, and, and asking the unconscious because some part some part of you might be saying, I want to process my trauma and I want to get in there and tell you all about it. And I'm going to be like, you know, I really care about what happened to you, but I also care that you can manage what surfaces when you start talking about. The way you just phrased that is so perfection. Yeah. And, and hypnotically we can kind of like, let's explore what your unconscious mind has to say. Mm. about the pace of sharing, you know, because there might be one part that one, when we talk about dissociation, it's parts that are disconnected. Yeah. So there might be a part that's like, I'm ready to go through this. And, and the unconscious mind is saying, no, I'm not going to let this work. No, this isn't okay. No, this isn't safe and manageable. And, and then an application doesn't work or it goes awry. And part mm -hmm. of it is because we haven't checked out the pace is the unconscious board with whatever application you're going to do, whether it be EMDR, whether it's something else, we need to see that the whole self is going to be okay. Um, when we do something, because it's a, you know, we are according to, you know, the Watkins and I think there's been other research along the way. I mean, I know there has that, that, that shows the evidence that we have multiple aspects of ourselves. Mm, mm -hmm. We all do. Yeah. not just those with um, dissociative disorders. So. Yeah. so can you describe a time, maybe it's a specific client or even someone you supervised where something just went really well with hypnosis and where you feel like, you know, those keys to comfort really came together or something just felt profound and there was a shift? You know, there's so many, I, I it's hard to pick just one, but I think one that stands out because it was so efficient and so evident, and it was a, a individual who he was new in recovery for addiction, and he was um, maybe three months um, sober, very anxious, very vigilant. I mean, just fidgety and and um, coming in, and you know, he had lost his vice. You know, he he was given up his vice. And so he was very nervous about coming in and so nervous that I couldn't even gather information. It was, it, it was just evident that if we were going to get anywhere, we just had to get him more comfortable. Yeah. And I, so early on, I said, I, I really want to just help you feel a little bit more comfortable. We're not going to talk about anything traumatic. I just want you to more be more comfortable in this setting. And I'm wondering if you'd be willing to try a hypnotic application for comfort and to see if we can't help you allow your body to, uh, to, to shift in a little more comfortable position. And he was open and we did a hypnotic elicitation where I'm guiding him into a trance experience. That's you know, what formal hypnosis is that I'm doing it with you. It's not something you spontaneously go. And he shifted and he became, he was highly hypnotic. He became very still. And I gave um, suggestions for comfort and, and asked him to bring back with him some of the comfort he had allowed himself to obtain as we reorientated. And when, when he came out, he said, that's the calmest I've ever felt in my entire life. Wow. And I'm like, you know, and then we, we strength that, you know, you get a moment like that. And it's like, wow, yeah. you know, because it's not something I did. Right. It's something he did. Yeah. So then we reinforce the, the, the self-efficacy, like, wow, look what you 
you were able to do in just a few moments of time. Mm. You were able to get your body more comfortable than it has ever been. Just think what else your unconscious mind can help you with. Yes. And it sets up a platform of hope and expectancy and an ex- nothing like that powerful experience in, a, in the first session of therapy. It was totally unrelated to trauma or anything. And it, you shouldn't go there right off the bat. You want clients to get in touch with the strengths, something they can do that's yeah. positive, helpful, yeah. right? So that they're actually excited about coming back to therapy than dreading it. Yeah. You know, I've been remembering uh, just the the words of encouragement or affirmation. I think you have another term for it too, of just the gentle ways you encourage people along. You know, that's it. There you go. You kind of see their shoulders softening and, oh, yeah, okay, yeah notice that. And, you know, you chose that. And just these gentle words of affirmation over time that I feel like, you know, so many people either didn't get enough of in their development and or still don't get enough of in daily life. You mentioned that internal dialogue earlier and how like we tend to not be that way with ourselves. Either like, oh, there you go. That's it. Hey, nice job. I see I see that you're softening. Like we just don't get that encouragement and validation. And I feel like that is such a beautiful part of, of my experience learning clinical hypnosis too, is just experiencing as, you know, a subject and then also sharing with others, just those gentle words of affirmation to let you settle in and connect with that unconscious or inner wisdom or or however we want to understand it. Yeah. Well, it's, it's very, um, it's a very powerful experience to have somebody present with you in that way, you know, and it's, I, I I think we, we teach attunement, you know, and what I love about Uh, hypnosis and ego state therapy is you don't have to be a therapeutic genius because the resources and they come from your client. Yeah. What you have to do is attune and know how to attune and utilize what they give you. Yeah. And if you're worried about, you know, finding that right piece of knowledge or or looking for the next training sometimes i'm telling my consultees because i do a lot of consultation the book you need is in front of you yeah it's your client right so how do you attune and listen in a way that feels safe and manageable to them because you know when we work with trauma folks and i have to throw this in here sometimes that level of attunement is experienced as a threat right And so then we have to adjust that, right? And we can still facilitate absorption, but we do it, you know, maybe we're both going to look at an an object and we'll talk about that object. So the attunement isn't, you know, right here with you and I. (laughs) Right now, I just became aware of our attunement (laughs) with each other because we care and love each other. So Uh we we've known each other for a long time, but, but that's one of the things that I love about clinical hypnosis is it's taught me to be very present and yes. attuned. And in that therapeutic trance state that we enter into um, when we do our therapy with our clients, or even when I do consultation with folks, it, it enhances our intuition. Yes. Right. Yeah. And and sometimes we'll be like, well, I don't know how I know that, but it's because I'm very present with that person. Yeah. Or know? I don't know why I'm thinking about this. And then they're like, yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> why this image is coming to mind. I, I'm grateful I learned early to trust those things and to just mm-hmm. speak them with, I don't know why, but this is coming to mind. Does this mean something to you? Mm-hmm. And, you know, nine times out of 10, it's like right on, right? Right. Wow, right. I was just thinking that, or, oh, that does mean something. Um, or even yeah. sometimes you don't get the full verbal feedback, but you see a shift, right? Right. And right. acknowledge something that's happening. So I, I'm really glad you bring up the attunement piece and you bring up the fact that the attunement can be threatening, right? Because right. Right. Well, I'm warm and I'm 
I'm supportive and this is exactly what I like and what I love to receive. And yet, you know, yeah. the person well, and, with is coming with something different. You know, I sometimes think I, I sound like a broken record when I teach um, hypnosis courses or, or even ego state therapy, because I'm always utilizing that language. Find just the right amount of space. Yes between you and I, that feels comfortable. You you can remain as far away as you need in order to feel safe and comfortable, but close enough to have a connection. Yes. It's another strategy or technique I have called playing with the space, you know, and how we utilize playing with the space within ourselves and with each other. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm aware as we're talking that I just want you to guide us on on a clinical hypnosis vacation, your voice and your whole presence, you do have so much of that hypnotic, you know, soothing energy. And so, I mean, I don't know if we can actually do that on the podcast, but that's my, that's my <laughs> one thought. And then my other one is just how, you know, I, I read some books on hypnobirthing and things like that while I was pregnant and just how helpful I think this is for parents for you know people who are birthing for pregnancy for all these or or even for for pain and for things that we're dealing with physically I feel like there's so many applications of hypnosis in everyday life where we might be thinking more right now about PTSD trauma and dissociation but there's there's so many ways especially when we talk about these keys for comfort yeah, we can tap into this. And I know you've had, you know, recordings over the years and things where you do have, oh, this one's a, this is a vacation and this one's yeah. maybe reducing anxiety or things like that. And what are some of the um, applications of, of hypnosis that you see kind of anyone could pick up and run with? I have hypnosis recordings that I've done that are very popular are the mental vacation where you just want to, you just want a mental vacation, you know, Um, and and quite often that's how I introduce hypnosis. How about just, what if you have an experience of just taking a mental vacation and, you know, on, on my mental vacation track, because we like different vacations. If I'm working with somebody, I want to say, where would you like to go? You know, but when it's the general public, if you had a traumatic experience at a beach, don't go to a beach. right? Right. Right. If you, and a traumatic experience in the mountains, don't go to the mountains. So you have to know yourself and, you know, listen to the, the cautions um, in the instructions with uh, any kind of self-hypnosis recording you're, you're using, um, because there are many out there. But my mental vacations, I think I have a, a track for a mountain vacation, a beach vacation. And in Minnesota, everyone has cabins. So there's a, a cabin, you know, cabin track. That's a helpful one. I also do a, a, a peaceful mind, peaceful sleep recording that has been very useful. I have those recordings available on my website that people can access, but I, I want to redo the peaceful sleep, peaceful mind one a little bit and uh, update it, but but they're still there for, for um, downloads. I've used it, hypnobirthing, um, yeah. you know, because there's all kinds of, I use self-hypnosis when I go to the dentist. I was just there last week and he's like, I can't believe you. I'm like, yeah, I don't want the Novocaine. Just, <laughs> yeah. you know, just let me go to the beach. Just give me a few moments. And, you know, when you've had years of practicing, because even if you're not that susceptible to trance, it is a skill that you can develop, yeah. you know, and, you know, so don't, you know, be discouraged if you have a hard time getting there. It it maybe is a hard time just for that moment. Yeah. Or it's a hard time with the person you're with. Maybe the sufficient trust isn't there or something else. So, you know, don't be discouraged um, by one bad experience. You know, um, there might be some other things that were or going on at the time or with the person that utilized it or the way the suggestion was presented. Yes. You know, so I always, I'm telling my, my clients, you know, be careful what you, and I think this goes for general communication. Be careful what you take in. Is this suggestion useful to you and in your best interest? Yes. Disregard anything that isn't. Yes. Right. I love that suggestion. 
<laughs> when you're on social, you know, and I think this is something I want to, I think is so important because people go get into social media. There's the TikTok trends. Yes. Right? Yes. You know, be careful when you are listening to TikTok oh. or when you are listening to scrolling that is facilitating absorption, mm -hmm. narrowing your focus. That is what hypnosis is. You are going into trance. There's a thing called trans logic. And when we go into trance, our critical thinking goes down. So you want to make sure you trust the information that is coming to you when you're in a state of trance. It can be really helpful um, and healing to hear things that are helpful for you and in your best interest. But it can be very destructive to hear things that are not in your best interest. You know, and if you're so focused and absorbed in the content, you're not thinking critically like this is not okay. I don't want this. And so we have to be careful what, what suggestions people are taking in. Yeah. It makes me think of, you know, we're talking about trauma informed dissociation informed clinical hypnosis, but also attachment informed or just relational, relationally informed. Like we, and, and while we have that, you know, discernment online, really discerning, do I feel safe and comfortable and supported in this relationship? Do I trust the suggestions or maybe even talking over with a provider? What are some of the suggestions that, that we'll get into today? Or what are some of the things that'll be most helpful for me? And deciding that even beforehand might help people feel, you know, safer, more supported, more comfortable and to actually get what they need. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's a lot of misconception, I think, about hypnosis. I mean, people think about clucking like a chicken on stage or, you know, being stuck, right. walking a funny way or these you know, more of that performative side of hypnosis. And I don't think, you know, in EMDR, you get trained in resourcing in so many different therapies. Thankfully, these days we focus on, you know, building up resources and, you know, finding ways to connect with positive internal experiences. And so that's a huge part of hypnosis is just that connection. And as you mentioned, the absorption, but also the connection to our own unconscious or our psyche or our, you know, sometimes people boil it down to like right brain, right? When we know that's oversimplified, but still it's like getting into that more creative space. And I remember after I did training, I had a client who was very eager to try hypnosis and he was very logical and practical and he would have these powerful experiences and then come out and question them. I don't know. What was that? I don't what, yeah. <laughs> I know. Right. Speaking because, of integration, it was like this, this so creative and so in-depth, yeah. you know, I would say five things and you right? get the whole experience and come out and be like, yeah, I don't know where that came from. I was like, it, it didn't come from me. It definitely came from you. Right. And that's, you know, sometimes we have, we, I, I like to incorporate trans ratifying experiences that when the client comes out, well, I don't know if I was really in trance or I don't know if I, and I'll be like, well, what do you think about when your hands like, you know, couldn't come apart or, and they'll be like, oh yeah, that's right. Like, you know, because when they come out of trance, what you're talking about is then they're back, that critical thinker is back online. Yeah. hundred right? percent. Yeah. They were able to suspend that for a moment in a helpful healing way. Right. Yeah. Yes. So it just made them less resistant and let they let their body and unconscious work for them and have these these cool experiences. So mm -hmm. I think some psychoeducation sometimes and just normalizing hypnosis, yeah. right? There are, the myths and misconceptions, and sometimes I'll I'll take entertainment. Well, you know, if you felt like you were driving a race car and you were hot, like yeah, you could if the power of suggestion yeah. can create experiences now i guarantee you there was a part of you and and hilgard term this the hidden observer there's mm -hmm. a part of you that knew you weren't driving a race car or weren't in squelching heat but you were so absorbed and facilitated your imagination could take you there and your 
we know research, they've done research with imaging for like say sports performance, right? I saw this research with gymnastics where, you know, they were imaging, just using their imagination to think about their form, right? And when they do that imaging, their brain lights up as if they were actually doing the form. Someone just told me this and I wrote it down. I'm going to, I'm probably going to get it wrong here, but, and I'm like, well, that's, that's a cell for hypnosis. I think it was the Olympic hockey team. Like every one of them had to utilize some sort of imagery or perform- clinical hypnosis for performance enhancement. Cause we know it's used a lot with athletes. Yeah. I like to use Albert Einstein's quote, imagination is more important than knowledge. Yes. Or um, another one, logic will get you from A to B, but your imagination can take you anywhere. Nice. That reminds me of when I took mathematical logic in Italian and it was all these like Beth tables, tabula di Beth, and it was like A, B, 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 A, C. I was like, ah, no. (laughs) And oh, I'm going to have hypnosis just for the trauma of this class. (laughs) Right. And so, you know, and and it's experiences like that. Now we were talking about that. Right. And so it opened, you weren't conscious of of thinking about that class, like probably 30 minutes ago. No. And that's why suggestions can lead us to, to many different things from our unconscious mind. And that's why we want to be careful with how we tailor our suggestions, especially with trauma. You know, um, right. the hypnotic language and the the art of being hypnotic is is the language we use. Yes. Yeah. For instance, when I'm at the dentist, you mm-hmm. know, I had to educate a dentist one time and say, "Oh, you know, please don't say you're going to feel this. It's all right if you say it. Now I'm going to apply pressure." Right. I'm good. But I'm in a trance. I'm somewhere else. And now you're going to say, now you're going to feel, I'm going to, I'm going to take that suggestion in. Yes. So it's, it's not helpful, you know? So so, that's so important. And I'm thinking about, you know, across medical professions, how important it is to understand that I'm going to apply pressure versus you're going to feel this. You're going to feel that. Right. We Absolutely. Hear that. And if we're in any type of trance, and even if not, we're then we're ready for that feeling. And yeah. we're primed for that feeling rather than just being primed for, oh, you're you're doing something and you need me to know, or you want to right. ask consent or whatever it is. The the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis actually has a, a workshop, I, I believe Linda Thompson um created, who's a pediatric um, nurse practitioner. And it, it's called the power of words. Yes. Right. Even if you don't have hypnosis training, hypnosis training just teaches you how to elicit trance and use it with intention therapeutically for many applications. And that's the value of training. The art of being hypnotic is language that can be useful for anybody, relationships, um, medical profession, the language we provide ourselves. We, we, we hear our thoughts all day long, you know, and, and um, we want to learn to talk to ourselves as positively as we would talk to others. Yeah. Yeah. And, and careful what suggestions you're giving yourself. With trauma, much of the hypnosis we're doing is undoing yeah. fixed suggestions because many people have given themselves suggestions that have become dysfunctional self-hypnotic suggestions. Yeah. And we have to undo those. What would it be? What would you like to think instead? Yeah. What would be in your best interest in 2023 going forward? Yeah. Right. I love that. Yeah. So what would you say to someone who's interested in hypnosis, who's wanting to learn more? Maybe this is, you know, their first time hearing about it or they're early in the exploration. Where would you send them? Well, um, it depends if it's a client, you know, the the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis um, website, which I believe is, ASCH.net, N-E-T, 
has like a facts and questions. Um, they have a directory for therapists. They have training. On my website, I have the, the trainings I provide. I, I do some trainings for ASH, some for ISSTD, and I, I do, I have some of my own. If you're a clinician and I really recommend ego state therapy regardless. And I'm not just saying that because I teach it. I, I really am very passionate about the principles that it's an overall approach, regardless of what modalities you're going to use. If it's IFS, if it's EMDR, if it's hypnosis, it will guide your overall therapy as well as inform you about dissociation and dissociative disorders and the people that fall to the far right of that differentiation dissociation continuum those with dissociative identity disorder we use ego state therapy for everybody not yeah. just for those with dissociative i learned it with the folks that are on the far end of that continuum those that dissociate for trauma and develop yeah. that disorder as a defense but it is useful for all of us yeah. you know and I'm so, going to plug in for your trainings, having been in them personally. I'm just going to put a plug in for you in general, because yeah, that true. trust. And there's also, you know, I know so many therapists and there's just some that just have the, there's just the vibe that you just need to stand near them. And you're like, I feel better. <laughs> and you're one of them. And so <laughs> you know, everyone's yeah. open to their own experience, but I'll just want to tell people that that's how, that's my experience with you is all oh, you just need to stand nearby and everything feels better. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's a very excellent compliment. Um, and I, I do believe sometimes Lisa, it's not what we know, it's who we are. Yeah, you know, with with our clients, Agreed. you know, yeah. um, and hypnosis and ego state therapy. I say that, but my intentions are fueled with that knowledge that I have, as well as my experience. Yeah. And I have learned the most. I've had the greatest mentors that you can have, but I've learned the most from my clients. Yeah. So I have an important question for you. Okay. <laughs> what brings you hope these days? Uh well, people like you, Lisa. <laughs> Stop it. Keep going. Yeah. People like your mother. Um, yes. Your mother is an angel on this earth as well. Love Lynette her. is, uh, for those many people know Lynette as well. I'm very hopeful about, um, there's so many things that we could be discouraged by. But, you know, clinical hypnosis teaches us, it's where we put our focus, Yeah. right? If you want put your focus on the ugliness, you're going to feel ugly. Yeah. If you want to put your focus on hope and the beauty and, and facilitate your absorption in experiences that are wonderful and mm. peaceful and hopeful. And that doesn't mean I don't get bogged down. You know, I've had lots of tragedies in my life, right? Yeah. You know, that's what I see hope. I see hope. I'm, I'm, really excited at this point in my career to be shifting. I love working with clients, but I'm, I, you know, I want to make a difference and, and it's very rewarding to see these clients sell. And now it's rewarding as a consultant to have my consultees say, Oh, I tried this and this was so cool. And they're getting, you know, I love that I'm igniting the passion for ego state therapy and hypnosis because those have been what have guided my work and cl clients have been so grateful. And if we can help more people and now we're getting more people to help more people all around the globe, yes. you know, that's exciting. And it's, 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 it's hopeful long before Lisa knows my, my youngest daughter is now, um, blind and um, long before this occurred in her life this was my one of my favorite quotes was the this is a Helen Keller quote mm -hmm. and it's the world is full of suffering but it's also full of the overcoming of it yes and I like that quote too I think if we focus on what in a, and I look at with my daughter Kelly she focuses on what she can do not what she can't yeah. you know doesn't mean it's not hard and you have those days where, you know, you get stuck in grief or, you sure. know, yeah. but you don't stay there. Yeah. One of my metaphors, we utilize, uh, utilize a lot of metaphors with hypnosis. And one of my 
metaphors that are utilized with clients is, you know, what train are you on? Yeah. You know, and is that train bringing you to a helpful destination? Yeah. If not, you can't, you, you can't help the train you get on. Sometimes, sometimes we wander on there. Sometimes our unconscious mind triggers us onto a train of thought, yeah. but you can decide how long you're going to stay on that train. Yeah. You can get off the train or you can find resources within to help yeah. guide you off the train, walk across the platform and get on a train that will take you to more hopeful experiences. Yes. I love right? that. Yes. You can pull that little, I'm thinking these are maybe more buses and trams, but you know, you pull that little thing. Yes. that's like next stop, please let me off. Yes. Excellent. Right. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. That's another and, thing with incorporation, you know, it, yeah. Milton Erickson had a concept of utilization. When you're present with clients, you get those things. Oh, you take the bus. We're going to use the bus. Yes. Because they know this rather than a train. Yeah. You can press that little button. Anything that like, I feel like when there's a somatic indicator, like I'm even just reaching up, like I'm going to grab something yeah. or press the button, right? It yeah. gives us a sense of agency in the moment and involves our bodies in a really... And I think, in fun way. you know, the, the hypnosis has changed. Um, I, I just recently wrote a, a chapter for a book that, that will be published in German. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but, folks in know, Germany, folks in uh, right. Switzerland. Um, right. But, you know, it was really looking at um, where hypnosis has, has come from. Um, and I had the, the section on ego state therapy and I was really looking at it. And I remember a quote, I think from a a video I did with John Watkins back in the day I interviewed him and he said, I think ego state therapy will evolve to be not ego state therapy, but a therapeutic approach that incorporates many different modalities. Mm. Something Mm -hmm. that um, he said it much more eloquently than I can, but, and I, it, it really has, you know, that's where I'm like, John, in that interview I found from a a video clip I have was, you know, back in like early 2000s, maybe, or, or, um, but several years ago. And that's really where it's come. And I think hypnosis has evolved to incorporate more body suggestions to, you know, it's not just up here, it's incorporating and involving different things, you know, so we can anchor as a key to comfort with putting your thumb and forefinger together so that we basically it's conditioning, right? Yeah. Triggers for trauma have been conditioned. Yes. Hypnotically we can condition keys for comfort. Yes. So if you're, you're on that wrong train, you can get off across the platform you can do some things, you know, you have some skills that are reinforced yeah, and so much agency in what you're describing, right? N- recognizing that these triggers are things that have been trained through experience and recognizing that there are other experiences we can, you know, consciously choose by going to therapy or doing clinical hypnosis or whatever that is, practicing yoga, however, right? You can go in that direction and then you can have you can consciously choose things that right. shift the internal narrative, right. Or the, or our internal experience. And that can be through our body. That can be through visualization. That can be through hypnosis. That can be so many avenues. But what I love about that is there's, there's hope in that, right. There's hope in, you don't have to keep reliving the awful, which is what PTSD often is. It's just that reliving or avoiding and being sort of stuck in this traumatic or negative experience, but we can consciously you know, get on a different train as many times as we need to until we go, oh, this train is going somewhere I want to go. Right. We have to create that disruption, interruption of a negative trance. You know, that's why I say much of trauma work is undoing. It is. It's undoing suggestions that you learn to believe from people that didn't have your interest, best interest at heart. Why are you still following those suggestions? right? They become fixed and conditioned in your mind. So we have to undo that and create new, more useful, helpful connections. 
And there's just so much agency in that, right? It's recognizing this came from somewhere else. It's putting it back where it belongs. It's replacing it. It's consciously choosing people that we trust that do have our best interests in mind to be around. And that's like much easier said than done, right? That that can be quite a process, right. but yeah, to right. be able to make those choices, yeah, I think a lot about power and control and trust and agency and all these things. And I just love that, you know, we're talking about clinical hypnosis, but in the end, we're also talking, we're talking about trauma and dissociation and attachment and human relationship and all these things that I think are foundation for, for good, any kind of healing work. Right. right. And, you know, we've talked about a lot of ego strengthening and applications for hypnosis that are really useful in like keys for comfort, but there are therapeutic applications all across the phases of treatment of trauma, right? So most people know trauma is best in a phase-oriented approach where you focused on affect regulation and skills and safety and stability first. Mm -hmm. um, but there are, there are hypnotic applications to help guide trauma processing in a safe and manageable way. You know, distancing techniques involved utilizing the imagination. And folks who, who were really traumatized used dissociation as a defense. They figured it out as a kid. Yeah. They, they were utilizing dissociation to help them. Yes. And so we just need to make sure that now that defense isn't causing problems or distress. Right. There are ways to dissociate in a healing, helpful way. Mm. We don't want to take that ability away, but we want to make sure it's not causing problems in 2023 and going forward. Yeah. So how can people connect with you, Wendy? I do a lot of teaching and consulting work now, and you can um, find me on my website, which is Wendy Lemke, L-E-M-K-E hyphen P-S-Y dot com. And there's a lot of information. I have a professional Facebook page. There's a link on my website to the professional Facebook page as well. And my trainings and things are there. My website needs help. <laughs> you. I feel like you know, to have a website is to have a website that needs help. <laughs> like unless right. you're a developer yourself, right? Right. When you're a therapist and you think you can do all things, you know, like website design, yeah. um, it it's not the most efficient. Please email me if you, um, you know, can't find something. And my, my email is Wendy Lemke LP at gmail.com. So yeah. thank you so much, Wendy, just for being here and sharing your zone of genius with us. I, yeah, we need to set up a, a happy hour or something sometime yeah. soon because I just miss you. And I just love spending this time with you. I hope everyone else has internalized some of this wonderfulness and yeah, maybe we'll have you back on at some point. Yes. Love and hugs to you and your new baby Yay. and your family. Thank so you, lots of love. We'll talk soon. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thanks so much for listening. My hope is that you walk away from these episodes feeling supported and like you have a place to come to find the hope and inspiration you need to take your next small step forward. For more information and resources, please visit my website, howwecanheal.com. There you'll find tons of helpful resources and the full transcript of each show. You can also click the podcast menu to submit requests for upcoming topics and guests. I look forward to hearing your ideas. Thank you.